When we tell the story of fintech or modern finance, we would not be doing it justice if we did not tell the story of the people behind it. More precisely, the generations of people behind it. The development of fintech, past, present and future, really is a generational thing. And this is where it has such relevance for you as you watch this video and perhaps ponder your future career path. Indeed, it is your generation who will shape the future of fintech and with it shape much more than financial services. The generations of interest are depicted in this simple graphic. The images can be taken as indicative of how members of each generation might look in the present. As we move from left to right, we have the baby boomers. Next, we have Gen X, Generation X or Gen X. Next, the Millennials or Gen Y. And finally, Gen Z, your generation. The year boundaries used to define the generations are approximate, but they are close enough to be helpful. Baby Boomer refers to those born in the two decades or so following the end of World War II. This generation would bring us flower power and hippies. It also gave us tech giants such as Bill Gates of Microsoft and Windows, Steve Jobs of Apple, collectively personal computing, and Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the World Wide Web building on the already existing internet in a way that took it into the public domain. As a slight aside, all three were born in 1955, so clearly a good year for tech wine. Apple would go on to introduce the iPhone, probably still the best known of the smartphones, personal computing and the World Wide Web, or the internet as we tend to use in short, laid the foundations for how we live and work our lives today. That was already the case before the world got sick in 2020, but the coronavirus pandemic has elevated remote working and business, and with it fintech, to a whole new level of significance. On top of this, we've had the smartphone evolution, fueled by the kind of computing power, if measured by processing speed that is, that only 20 years ago needed a building to house it. Available only to national supercomputing labs or organisations of that ilk, yet today we all have access to it and it fits in our pocket. The fact is illustrated here by comparing the latest generation of smartphones with the IBM supercomputer pictured in the Liverpool, Livermore lab of University of California, Berkeley. A supercomputer assembled at the time to perform test simulations for nuclear weapons research. And here's a quote from Bill Gates himself, who is perhaps better known nowadays for philanthropy uh, than tech or fintech for that matter. We need banking, but we don't need banks anymore. Do you think someday we can open a bank account or ask for a loan without physically having to come into the bank? Now, given that this statement was made almost 30 years ago, and thus well over a decade before the appearance of Apple's first iPhone, it is pretty much on the money. Technically, we do still need banks, not least as entities who can store our money with trust. And that is not to understate the damage that the global financial crisis of 2007-2008 did to our trust of banks, which in itself is an important part of the fintech story. However, we certainly are better off keeping our money in the bank than under the bed, even ignoring interest rates and inflation. Indeed, the workings of national economies have banks at the core, as does global trade. Alas, we do very much still need banks. Nothing else in this quote from Bill Gates is up for debate though. As far as his reference to bank accounts and loans is concerned, mobile devices, mobile networks and the internet have seen to that. In fact, whilst on the topic of mobile devices, it would not be unreasonable to refer to the smartphone as the fintech machine. The price of mobile devices is dropping all the time. To the extent that 3.5 billion people worldwide heading towards 50% of the population, have a smartphone. And almost 5.3 billion people, more than two thirds of the population, have a mobile device. That is a much larger percentage than have an active bank account. And when it comes to mobile connections, we have even more of those than there are people on the planet, at almost 10 billion. Around the same time that Gates, Jobs and Berners-Lee were born, the world of finance was seeing its fair share of innovation too. For instance, the credit card first appeared. Here are the first few. 
the Diners Club card from 1950 was technically a charge card as the balance had to be paid in full at the end of each month. So American Express might be considered the first full-blooded credit card and the first to appear in the UK was the Barclay card um, in the mid 60s. Now if you were to look into how the earliest credit cards operated in practice and the underlying protracted complexity it would hardly seem like a, technical, uh, like a technological innovation by today's standards. But they really were a game changer in personal finance. This together with other changes in the world of finance and investment, both technology and mentality related, leads us naturally to considering the next generation of participant in the fintech evolution story. Generation X or Gen X. Perhaps best known as the greed is good generation, certainly as far as financial services is concerned. Technological innovation continued to pace through the 70s and 80s and onwards. And as with essentially any technology, it can be used to do good or not good, depending on the user's intention. The industry-wide mentality of greed, unapologetic self-interest and irresponsible practices of the time is portrayed quite effectively in the film Wall Street starring Michael Douglas as ruthless financier Gordon Gekko, here sporting uh, the stereotypical braces. The film is also unfortunately credited with inspiring many aspiring Gordon Geckos in real life. The culture of me, me, me would find its way to the core of banking and investment and precipitate the global financial crisis of 2007-2008. Note the article in an issue of Fortune magazine dated May 2005, roughly two and a half years before the collapse. A little prophetic and how it draws strong parallels between the practices of the day and the blockbuster Hollywood movie. Is greed still good, it asks. The hedge funds think so. And if Gordon Gecko was on Wall Street in 2005, they would eat him for breakfast. Now that is saying something. But that is the state that the system had got itself into. The financial crisis that followed and its social and economic consequences from a fintech point of view is where the next generation enter proceedings. Generation Y, Gen Y or the Millennials by their better known title. People born in the 80s and the first half of the 90s are referred to as Millennials. The name alluding to the fact that this generation came to age in the information age. For many millennials, the global financial crisis was their first real exposure as young adults to banking and finance in general. As first impressions go, they don't get much worse than this. Children of the baby boomers, many millennials saw their parents lose their homes, businesses, livelihoods as a direct result of the goings on in the financial services industry. So they didn't trust the system and not only had they motive to change it, but they had at their disposal the tech tools to do so. That's why they're called millennials after all. And this really is the why, the when and how the term fintech as we currently think of it was born. Much of the really innovative stuff in fintech has been done by millennials and here are a few examples. This particular millennial and the company he created need no introduction. The worth saying that 36 is his current age in early 2021. He was still only 19 when he launched Facebook. Whilst never set up with finance in mind, Facebook represented a paradigm shift for social interaction and pioneered the role of platforms in the new tech world. Nowadays we have the world's largest content company, Facebook themselves, not creating any content. The world's largest hotel chain, not owning, not owning any hotels, the world's largest taxi company not owning any taxis and so on. Platforms, online marketplaces which bring buyers and sellers together or consumers of a product and service with suppliers of that same product or service are ubiquitous uh, across online industries generally. Zuckerberg's platform innovation paved the way for adaptation to financial services and almost certainly was the inspiration behind many fintech startups. Indeed, Facebook itself nowadays is increasingly involved in providing financial services. Next, we have Ethereum. Ethereum is a global open source platform. There's that world platform again. 
for decentralized applications. Ethereum is about six years old now, so here again we have someone just out of their teenage years being able to start something of this magnitude. Ethereum is perhaps a natural successor to Bitcoin, a name you may be more familiar with, as something which operates on very similar tech principles, cryptocurrency, blockchain and mining, but which is designed to be more than a decentralized payment system. Next, we have two Estonians, Henrikus and Karman, founders of TransferWise, an online money transfer service, a fintech unicorn company. Henrikus was the first employee of another Estonian-born unicorn, Skype, a name you will be familiar with. And nowadays, we even have individuals starting banks. Sounds a little crazy, I know. Challenger banks, as they are known, Monza is a great example. More generally, we have young fintech startups who don't want to be banks, but who want to work with existing banks to design bespoke applications that are exceptionally high quality because they specialize in one in only one area of provision or service. As a result, we find established banks partnering with a range of fintech companies to develop an overall portfolio of high quality tech enhanced financial services. And these guys, they were 26 when they founded Venmo, a mobile payment service with a social media interactivity layer designed to take the awkwardness out of paying for a shared bill in a restaurant, etc. Venmo is now owned by PayPal. Some of these people are even former bankers. Nikolai Soronsky founded Revolut when he was 30. It is now one of Europe's breakout unicorns. Nikolai was working for the fabled Lehman Brothers in 2008 when the old financial system collapsed. He is one of the millennials building a new financial system, as are these guys with a distinctly local significance. Patrick and John Collinson, who at the ages of 19 and 21 respectively, started a company called Stripe. 11 years on, and Stripe is one of the largest fintech unicorns in the world, and this pair in 2016 became the world's youngest self-made billionaires. Stripe was valued at 9.2 billion in October 2016, almost quadrupling in value since, such that in October 2020, Stripe was valued at $36 billion. Not bad for a couple of kids originally from rural Tipperary. The fields of finance and technology have traditionally both been very uh, much male dominated. But thankfully, fintech has seen and is increasingly seeing women take influential and leadership roles right across the piece. Here I focus on just a few taken from the Innovate Finance Women in Fintech webpage. My selection, while it's essentially random, gives some insight into the range of ways in which women are entering and shaping the industry. Of course, from the point of view of recruiting to our fintech uh, apprenticeship, this is great news. These women and many others like them will hopefully inspire other young women to get involved in this space. For anyone who wants to take a more detailed look, I provide a link to the site in a later slide. Here we have Diana Avila, Global Head of Banking for Transferwise, a company featured in one of the earlier slides. Or this woman, Evelina Vrabi, Chief Technical Officer for Tucan, a software engineer by profession. Or Jennifer Byrne, CEO and co-founder of Kesney, or Alison Choi, head of machine learning at Starling Bank. That was only a tiny selection of women in fintech, but enough to see the diversity of leadership roles they are performing. Leading strategy, leading operations, leading financial and technology innovation, leading entire organizations. I have provided the link here if you want to look a little further into this aspect of the industry. This takes us to the present time and to the generation who will take the torch from the millennials and with it leave their mark on the financial services industry and society generally. Millennials have made fantastic progress in the digitization of financial services with a view to including literally billions of people worldwide who were hitherto excluded. Millennials have demonstrated that in business, profit and purpose are not mutually exclusive. Gen Z can build on the work done and take things to a new level. Embedding financial services into our daily lives, making payments and purchases essentially frictionless, 
further increasing access to affordable services, increasing choice and transparency, making for fair and open competition, and the democratisation of wealth and influence. Opening up financial services, doing business, running companies, running economies with the same ease and indeed essentially the same technology infrastructure that people interact with social media presently. The related concepts of decentralisation and democratisation are key and it is through the social engineering and trust built in technologies of blockchain and consensus that not only the smallest of financial actions and transactions can be facilitated but the biggest decisions of all those regarding global sustainability and climate change. And we need this because the top-down approach of government-led initiatives to address climate change and sustainability has really went nowhere. Nowadays we have national governments and world leaders behaving like children while children behave like leaders. For some time now we have saw growth in market investments towards environmentally and socially responsible stocks and companies. ESG investment, as it is called, is now a recognised investment theme and the world's major stock markets now have ESG indices such as the Standard & Poor's or S&P 500 ESG trading on the New York Stock Exchange. It consists of the same companies trading on the conventional S&P 500 but they are scored or rated by ESG signals, predictors of positive sustainability traits. The FTSE also has a range of ESG indices as highlighted here. Going forward we will increasingly see sustainability considerations being written into the legal constitution of companies, explicitly detailing what they stand for and what actions they are taking to address their own carbon footprint etc. It is fair to say that the United Kingdom has positioned itself as a world leader in this regard, requiring greater levels of disclosure than others. As investment opportunities become more widely distributed and decentralised, then more and more people can vote through their fintech machines. And companies who don't provide more transparency on this aspect of their, their activities will find their pool of investors shrinking and getting left behind as a result, because the green is good generation will see to it. Just as millennials had the motive and tools to build a new financial system, you have the motive and fintech will provide you with the tools to take the power out of the hands of those who have demonstrated they don't deserve it and put it into the hands of people who will use it more constructively. And the sooner the better. 71% of greenhouse gas emissions has come from just 100 companies since 1988 when I was your age. More than half of that comes from just 25 companies. The fossil fuel companies the Shells, the BPs, the Saudi Aramcos. If the banks change the way they support these companies, we could settle the climate debate almost overnight because these companies would either go bust or be forced to behave in a much more responsible manner. But the banks of yesterday and to a large extent of today still support them because they are making profit out of it. And for the greed is good generation, the bottom line is the bottom line. But what about the banks of tomorrow? Most kids don't agree with greed is good. I don't agree with it. Greta Thunberg doesn't agree with it. Some decision makers know exactly what they are sacrificing to continue making unimaginable amounts of money. We cannot continue to do that if the planet is to remain safe for you, your children and their children and so on. Now, thankfully, it is not all doom and gloom. The good news is that things are happening with technology and finance that is doing good for society and good for planet Earth. These are the cultural values that sit at the core of many of the bright young startups because they are being started up by Gen Y and Gen Z individuals who want to make a change. Technology can change the world and it can help the planet. Fintechs are reaching parts of the world that were historically unreachable. There are startups looking at how we can provide financial literacy to children Mental health issues and financial issues often go hand in hand. Some of these problems can be identified through analysing spending habits and interventions can take place to provide support so that financial wellness can help men mental wellness and vice versa. And there, there are many startups focusing on financial wellness. 
Our parents, our grandparents, are the most vulnerable in society from criminals and scammers. And we can use fintech to help them. But the banks never used to do any of this because there wasn't any money in it. In fact, financial inclusion is one of the biggest growth areas in fintech where historically it has not been worth banking almost 5 billion of the world's population because it was just not going to make a profit. Yet digital inclusion has the potential to reach every single person on earth if you have a mobile phone, as most of us do. As soon as you have a mobile phone, you can trade, transact, interact, have your voice heard, get opportunity. This has been proven over and over again worldwide. Some excellent examples are illustrated in the next few slides. The UK company Vodafone, in the guise of Safaricom, won a Kenyan government contract in 2007 to set up a mobile payment system in Kenya to facilitate long distance transfer of money across a country with little or no financial, technology or travel infrastructure outside some key population centres. The motivating factor was that many migrant workers were working, making long, arduous and dangerous journeys across Kenya's landmass to take money home to family and friends, needing to deliver it physically into their hands. M-Pesa means that the same money is being transferred by text message on feature phones. Yes, initially the system used old feature phones because of the scarcity of smartphones and the issue of smartphones needing much more regular charging. A very simple system based on sound business principles was put in operation and it allowed many Kenyans to rise out of poverty. Modified versions of M-Pesa now exist in smartphone format following greatly increased access to smartphones and solar charging units and indeed has been rolled out to several other countries. Another nice example is shown here in the street markets of New Delhi in India. You can purchase basic everyday goods with Paytm, Pay Through Mobile, one of the biggest mobile financial operators in India with over 300 million users. If you go anywhere in India, you can purchase with Paytm mobile wallets using QR codes. Even in the temples, you can make donations by cash or by Paytm. Again, very simple technology underpins the process. Street merchants cannot afford card processing facilities, and even if they could, cards, credit and debit cards, are not common in India. Instead, the merchant displays a QR code, such as the one shown on screen, which contains encrypted details of their account. The customer simply opens their Paytm app, inputs the payment amount, scans the QR code, and the rest is looked after by software and telecommunications. The merchant gets a real-time notification to their phone that they have received the money and can therefore hand over the goods. Here we have Ma Yun, better known as Jack Ma, co-founder of Alibaba, one of the major tech success stories coming out of China. China, as you may well be aware, is set to become the largest economy in the world in the near future. In fact, a recent report by the IMF puts it at the top, using a more refined metric of purchasing power parity to measure GDP. If interested, you can find a link to that report in the final slide of this presentation. China is something about a fintech enigma. On one hand, they are going to be the first major economy to stop using cash, having been the first to start using it. Within the next two years, China's tier one cities will be cashless, and within a, within a decade after that, the rest of the country will follow. On the other hand, it is only 20 years ago that if you wanted a job as a bank teller in China, you had to pass a proficiency test in using an abacus. In an earlier video, I focused on America's most fintech progressive bank in JP Morgan Chase, and the statistics are impressive. An annual fintech budget of $11 billion, that's half of the annual spend in all of Europe on fintech. They have more software developers than Facebook and Twitter combined. I'm not saying that is a good thing or a bad thing, simply that it is a thing. But don't be misled. The adoption of technology and finance is being led by countries in Asia and parts of Africa and South America. This image highlights adoption levels from a global survey of 27,000 consumers across many national economies. The figures circled indicate the percentage of participants in a given market 
who had interacted with at least one fintech product or service. You can clearly see where it's happening. Perhaps ironically, this is good news for you folk and your career prospects, because the UK, in fact the Western world generally, will have to continue to grow and rise to meet the challenge from this new breed of fintech nations. And that will mean investment in jobs and skills. And of course, you may choose to relocate in the future. The good news is that in the world of tomorrow, almost literally tomorrow, fintech skills will travel as easily and smoothly as medical knowledge. Europe and North America are still by and large running on legacy infrastructure, perhaps through complacency resting on their laurels, but more likely in financial services terms, these are titanic sized ships laden with legacy cargo that simply cannot change direction quickly. When we think of a world superpower, whether in military or economic terms, the United States immediately springs to mind. And yet in fintech terms, the US is actually the world's largest user of cash and checks. Americans are still struggling with chip and pin, and yet we have China heading towards being completely cashless in little over a decade. A major step towards that ideal comes in the form of Alipay, launched by Alibaba. Arguably the most successful financial service in the world, it doesn't just allow you to pay for things, you can send, lend, invest, save and borrow. And you can lend and borrow as little as you like for as little time as you like, say 24 hours. You don't have to borrow for a year. Borrowing in units of years is another legacy hangover. Traditional banks that were based on paper methods couldn't allow you to borrow for 24 hours because the paperwork involved and the associated administrative costs that would have been passed on to you, the borrower, would have made it feel too costly for you and at the same time still not profitable enough for them. So lending to the retail customer, you and me in other words, for short term loans is not in the DNA of traditional incumbent banks. But Alipay has cracked that wide open and is sending it all over Asia. More recently, in fact, partnering with companies closer to home. Here with Barclay Card in 2019 and with TransferWise in March 2020. We can expect to see a lot more of this. Focusing solely on Paytech, it is worth taking a moment to absorb the sheer volume of money movement taking place. Some of the numbers involved are difficult to fathom. The combined mobile payments from Alipay and another player WeChat, who collectively have 80% of the market share in China, weighs in at a whopping 41 trillion US dollars. That's in 2018. In what follows, I am expressing everything in US dollars for convenience. Now, as I said, these figures represent money movement, so there, there may well be a lot of double counting. For instance, Perhaps someone in China had sent $50 to a friend using a digital wallet and that friend subsequently spent that $50 in an online shop paying the merchant from their digital wallet, then that $50 will appear as $100 in this total. So the 41 trillion captures the overall transaction total where the same money may appear more than once, hence the staggering grand total. However, I use it here primarily to compare and contrast with the pay tech level of activity taking place in the US, China's main rival for economic top spot. Now, in order to tra transform these long strings of zeros into something a little more digestible, I'm going to use the figure of $15 billion as representing the Northern Ireland block grant. Essentially, the money allocated to the Northern Ireland executive by central UK government to run public services in this country each year. Hopefully there isn't any double counting in this figure. In any case, what we can see is that if, if instead of the $15 billion, Rishi Sunak was to give us the figure of $41 trillion, we could run the Northern Ireland public services for the next 2,700 years. On the other hand, the $200 billion of mobile payments taking place in the United States in 2018 would run the country for a mere 13 years. There is a staggering 200 times more money movement by Paytech in China than in the US, and that really does hopefully put things in perspective. Clearly Paytech is making transacting much more accessible, affordable, fluid and instant. 
and that is fantastic news for financial inclusion. But does it have any positive impact on the climate side of things? Thankfully, yes. One individual in Alipay had an idea a few years ago. It was based on the notion of trying to change people's behaviour to be greener, to live more sustainably. So they created a game, Ant Forest, in the payment system, whereby every time you pay for something, it allocates points to you based on how green your behaviours are. If you drive to work and fill up at a petrol station, you get zero points. If you take the bus or train, you get five points. If you walk or cycle to work, you get 10 points. And what do points make? Well, trees, lots of trees. The game revolves around generating enough points to plant a virtual tree. But of course, virtual trees won't help remove any greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So when you earn enough points for a virtual tree, Alipay plant a real tree on your behalf. There are an excess of 500 million people playing this game and to date Alipay has planted well over 100 million trees across sparsely populated areas of northwest China. To date they have covered more than 1200 square kilometres, that's roughly the size of County Armagh, which by all accounts could reduce China's carbon footprint by 5%. It would appear that from fintech acorns many green trees grow. One idea from one person working for a financial company has resulted in a hundred million trees planted to date. What might your big idea be? That is one of the most inspiring things about fintech. Your ideas will count as much as anyone else's. Money will continue to make the world go round, but you will determine how. You will have the say in who gets access to investor money and what is done with it. The colour of money will still be green. Not though by the colour of the notes, because there won't be any notes, but by the colour of what it is used for. Corporate giants such as Microsoft and others to be fair, but I have chosen to mention Microsoft because they are being very open about their intentions and also they were a key player in building the technology foundations that much of modern day computing, data science and communications are built on. Microsoft is taking major strides to address its carbon footprint, not only going forward in a carbon neutral fashion, but planning to be carbon negative by 2030 in order to remove its historical carbon footprint completely by 2050. Now companies that are brave enough to take these steps deserve to get financial investment from your generation. And they will get it at the expense of other companies who choose not to make such commitments. The latter will not receive investment, or if they do, it will be on less favourable terms. All of this rests in the hands of the next generation of financiers. And that is why we created our FinTech degree apprenticeship and are the first university in the British Isles to do so. Now, we have all heard of the X Factor. Well, the world of finance does not need the X Factor, or should I say the Gen X Factor. It needs this Gen Z Factor. So if you have the Z Factor and would like to get involved in a career in FinTech, we would love to hear from you because our FinTech degree has been designed with you in mind.